Hello. This is the first part of a video series going over most of Robin Harshorn's book, Algebraic Geometry, in a fairly complete manner, as both a visual documentation of everything in the book, a potential reading guide, and a way to force myself to understand the basics of algebraic geometry by teaching it. On that note, while we're still in the intro, I'll warn you of four things. First, a basic understanding of the major ideas from undergraduate abstract algebra and topology will be implicitly assumed. There will be no review of major results that we will use foundationally. If you currently don't have any experience with either abstract algebra or topology and want to learn more, I recommend the free online books, Abstract Algebra, Theory and Application by Tom Judson, and Topology for the Working Mathematician by Michael Muger. Links in the description. Second, the technical heart of this book will rely on an understanding of a lot of ideas and theorems from commutative algebra, general category theory, and a fair few other higher level, or at least higher jargon, areas of math. The results and loose definitions will be stated explicitly at the beginning of a section, but very little, if anything, will be proved for them, since they are so besides the heart of algebraic geometry I want to get across in this series. It's likely I'll make a video series on these subjects um, a fair bit later, but for now this series will just be algebraic geometry inspired. Third, I claim absolutely no originality over any of the arguments made in this book. The textbook that we're going over, including the many arguments for proofs that will be given, are already decades old at least. The only originality I claim to is this video script and the specific order of visuals presented to better explain points. Fourth and finally, for at least the first video style, I'm simply shamelessly stealing Oliver Lug's style from their video, A Sensible Introduction to Category Theory, since they vigorously proved the style one can nicely convey information with, and it's possible to replicate it in Google Slides, and that's free. Also, an entire shout out to their channel and their math adjacent or purely mathematical videos, they're quite excellent. Now, without further ado, Let's begin the series with Chapter 1 Varieties Section 1 Affine Varieties For this section, we assume without proof some statements involving the Hilbert basis theorem, the Nolstelen sots, and some results in the dimension theory of K algebras for a field K, including Krull's Hopf to the Alstots. To start this chapter, a quick disclaimer. We're going to be working for nearly the whole chapter with objects that are derived from polynomials with coefficients in some field k, so we simply fix k now, and suppress k from all the notation in future where objects are implicitly defined with k in mind. As well, since it will end up being extremely nice to have the results of Hilbert's Nilschulensatz hold for k, don't worry if you've never heard of it, we'll go over what the statement means for us in more detail when it's needed, and the results hold for algebraically closed k, we assume that k is algebraically closed. If you don't want to think too hard about it, just assume that k is equal to c, the complex numbers. As well, all rings are assumed commutative, with identity, and morphisms of rings send 0 to 0 and 1 to 1. Now, to start properly, we're interested in studying spaces defined by polynomials with finitely many variables. Consider, for example, the unit circle with points x, y, defined by x squared plus y squared is equal to 1, that is geometrically studied by all math students, or or a more specialist example, pairs of points x, y, defined by the elliptic curve y squared is equal to x times x minus a to the p times x plus b to the p in setting for Ma's last theorem. As a quick aside, when we're visualizing spaces, we'll as a default think about c cross c and spaces defined by polynomials in two variables. However, since we don't have four dimensions to display images in, we'll consider instead the subspace r cross r when we're doing visualizations. Just note that since this is a two-dimensional cross-section of our whole space we care about, that we'll be missing out on some information in the visualizations. For example, the space defined by the unit sphere equation in C cross C is actually unbounded, but it is bounded in R cross R. For the previous equations, notice that checking if x and y satisfy the equation is equivalent to checking if a polynomial in two variables is equal to zero upon evaluation at the point x comma y by simply subtracting from one side. So for example, turning the unit circle equation into x squared plus y squared minus 1 is equal to 0, and the elliptic curve example into y squared minus x times x minus a to the p times x plus b to the p is equal to 0, which gives us a general blueprint to progress. Consider the product of our field with itself. Visually here we have displayed the subspace r times r of c times c. Now, the set of all elements of this space, which are formally n tuples of elements of our field k, is denoted a to the n, and is called affine n space over k. Now, let's see how polynomials can help describe this space. Consider some formal polynomial f in n variables. We can then naturally consider it as a function from affine n space to our base field k, which we'll demonstrate with an example. Consider the polynomial f defined by x squared plus y squared minus 1, 
which is formally an element of the set of polynomials in two variables with coefficients in C. Then, we evaluate this polynomial at a point, say 1, 0, by substituting our first variable with 1 and our second with 0, which gives us an expression we can evaluate using field operations to get the element 0, which is an element of our base field C. Thus, the formal element f is also a function from affine 2 space to our base field C. Now, fix some polynomial f. We'll for visualization fix f is equal to x squared plus y squared minus 1. Then we can define a shape by considering the set of all elements that are mapped to 0, which we'll denote by z of f, and refer to as the 0 set of f. Thus, we start by studying the set theoretic properties of the families of 0 sets. Before continuing, we introduce standard notation explicitly, since it's the first example that suppresses specific information in the notation. We denote by A the ring of polynomials in n variables with coefficients in our field k. Note here that both k and n are assumed to be known ahead of time. As well, I'll warn in advance of something to keep in mind when working through specific examples. Consider the regular old polynomial x squared plus y squared minus 1 in the ring of polynomials of two variables. Now, Consider the seemingly identical polynomial x squared plus y squared minus 1. However, this polynomial is actually x squared plus y squared minus 1 plus 0z in the ring of polynomials of three variables. Now, since our notation using a alone does not differentiate between these two examples, even if their zero sets up potentially very different properties topologically, we explicitly ask you to remember that a polynomial in n variables may be expressed as a polynomial in m variables for m strictly less than n, and to keep in mind these when interpreting algebraic and topological properties implied by things defined from these polynomials. Moving ahead from that disclaimer, consider polynomials f and g in the same number of variables. One of the most basic questions about the zero sets we can ask is whether we're able to find some polynomials h and h prime, such as the zero set of h is the same as the union of f's and g's, and the zero set of h primes is the same as the intersection of f's and g's which can be equivalently framed as the question of whether the family of zero sets is closed under finite union and intersection. We start by trying to answer this question for unions. Expanding the definition, we see that it's the set of all points that either evaluate to zero under f or evaluate to zero under g. Now, since k is a field, it is by definition an integral domain, and so the product of two functions with output in k is zero at a point if and only if either of the two functions are zero at the point p, in this case with p in affine n space. Now, this means we can change the condition for p to be a point in the union of the zero sets to something equivalent, which is simply the expanded definition of the zero set of the product of f and g. Thus, zero sets are closed under finite unions, QED. Considering how simple the union case would be, the intersection case would be just as simple, right? Right, it's, it's that simple, right? Consider one of the most simple intersections we can have z of x intersected with z of y, for x and y in the polynomial ring over two variables. We compute this to simply be the singleton containing only the origin point of our space. Now, we need the following lemma. The zero set of a polynomial is either empty or has infinite cardinality, if we have that the polynomial is at least of two variables. We prove it by cases. First, if f is a zero polynomial, then it is our entire space so it's equal to affine n space, which has infinite cardinality by algebraic closure of the field. Next, if it's a constant polynomial C, then by definition its zero set is the empty set if C is not zero. Finally, suppose that our polynomial is non-constant. For brevity of notation, we assume that it varies in the first variable, so fix the other variables arbitrarily in our algebraically closed field K. Then, we can define a non-constant polynomial G indexed by our chosen fixed variables by simply substituting their value into our original polynomial and simplifying. Since k is algebraically closed, by definition we have a solution to this polynomial, call it a, and so by definition the point a, x2, all the way to xn is in our zero set. Since there are infinitely many such ways we can fix the variables, because our field is algebraically closed, this implies the zero set of f is infinite, completing the lemma. Thus, Directly from this, we can say that there is no polynomial f, such that the zero set of x intersected with the zero set of y is the zero set of f. So zero sets are not closed under finite intersection. This ends up being an extremely unideal situation, so let's go about trying to fix this in the most natural way that we can. 
Since individual polynomials are singletons of the space of all polynomials, we start by letting phi be a subset of polynomials and a fixed number of variables. We know how to take the zero set of each element in phi, and we want intersection to hold, so we simply define the zero set of phi to be the intersection of all the zero sets of elements in phi. Call these subsets of affine space algebraic sets. Now, clearly he's fixed the issue of finite intersection, but in fact we have more. Take the arbitrary intersection of a family of algebraic sets. Then, rolling out the definitions gives us that this is the zero set of a union of subsets of polynomials, which is still a subset, and as such, algebraic sets are in fact closed under arbitrary intersection, QED. From here, note that since the family of algebraic sets are closed under arbitrary intersection, if we can show that it is both closed under finite unions, and that both affine end space itself and the empty sets are algebraic sets, the set of algebraic sets will then form the closed sets of a topology on affine end space, and we can then use topological methods to study that space. In pursuit of that goal, we check finite unions. Expanding the definitions, we see that it's an intersection of the union of zero sets of single polynomials. However, we see that we've computed this union before. Thus, replacing the union, we see that our union is equivalent to the intersection of spaces indexed by products. Thus, reminding ourselves of what it means to take the product of two subsets of a ring, we ultimately get that our union of two zero sets are equal to the zero set of the product of the two subsets, and as such we get that algebraic sets are closed under a certain type of union. However, since the computation relied on the products of elements, and we only respectively have finite products defined, we see that we can only say that our space is closed under finite unions. Still, as an upshot of all this, since the zero set of a singleton containing the zero set is affine end space, and the zero set of the singleton containing a non-zero constant polynomial is the empty set, we have that the algebraic sets are closed sets of a topology on affine end space, called the Zariski topology. Since that introduction of the topology was quite sudden, let's try to work around with it to get some footing for the abstraction. First, since our closed sets are algebraic sets which are intersections of zero sets for polynomials, our open sets are going to be unions of sets of the form of affine end space minus some zero set of a polynomial, or affine end space minus the space carved out by a zero set. From here, consider the specific example of affine end space for n equals 1, which is just equivalent to our base field k. Now, if you have some polynomial f in one variable, assuming it's not the boring case of it being constant, we can, for the sake of zero sets, assume it's monic and factor it into n distinct roots. In this case, we're letting n actually be a dummy variable of potentially different multiplicities, giving us that its zero set is comprised of a finite number of zeros. Thus, it's simple to see that all closed sets are comprised of only finite sets, and since any finite closed set of affine one space is a zero set of a polynomial, we have that k has cofinite topology. In particular, going against our normal topological intuition for cases like the complex numbers, we have that this topology is not Hausdorff. Now, notice so far that we have two sets we care about, the set of subsets of polynomials and the set of subsets of affine end space, and so far we've developed a map from polynomials to affine end space. Let's see if we can define a map in the other direction. For this, we start by introducing a motivating concept. Suppose that for some set y, we have a family of sets x whose intersection contains y. In this case, we say that the family approximates y, and since we care about algebraic sets, let's try to apply some type of algebraic approximation to y. For this process, we start with a subset y of affine n space. Then, we consider the set of all zero sets such that they contain y. Each zero set is the zero set of a polynomial f, so we can then collect all of these such polynomials into a subset of all polynomials of fixed number of variables, which we do formally by forming the set of all polynomials who have zero sets containing y, and denote this set by i of y. Now, we have that the set is closed under summation and multiplication, since both the sum and product of functions that equal zero at a point still equal zero, and the multiplication of any element of i y by an arbitrary polynomial still ends up being zero at any point where the function from i y equals zero, meaning that i y is in fact an ideal of the set of all polynomials, and as such, i y is called the ideal of y. Now. There are some pretty elementary properties of the ideal of a subset and zero set of a subset used that come from just expanding definitions, so I'll just collect them here without proof. However, after I state each of these, it would be a good time to stop and think about why these statements hold, 
to make sure you have a good foundation of understanding for the interplay between subsets of these two different spaces. First, suppose that we have two subsets of polynomials. Then, if one of these subsets contained the other, we'll have that the inclusion is actually reversed when looking at their zero sets. Next, suppose we have two subsets of affine space. Then, similarly to the last example, if one set is a subset of the other, then we have that inclusion is actually flipped again when looking at their ideals. Finally, while we're still looking at subsets of affine space, one of the more subtle properties that ends up being extremely important is that the ideal of the union of subsets is actually the intersection of the ideals of the subsets. With the results we've just proven, we're ready to start looking at some of the deeper relationships between the spaces we've been looking at. To do that, since we have functions that map subsets of one space to subsets of another, one of the first things we can do is look at what happens when we compose these functions with each other. We'll handle first the case of applying the zero set, followed by the ideal. Now, before continuing, it'll be nice to note something. Let phi be some subset of polynomials. Now, by an argument similar to that made during the proving that the ideal of y was actually an ideal, we have that the zero set of phi is equal to the zero set of the ideal generated by it. And so we, for simplicity, work with ideals of polynomials. Let alpha be such an ideal. Let f be an element of the ideal of the zero set of alpha. This, by definition, means that f evaluated at a point p equals zero for all points p that are equal to zero under every element of alpha. Now, by the result that we had mentioned way back at the start that motivated us to let k be an algebraically closed field, Hilbert Snowsolon sets, we have that f is actually in the radical of alpha, defined to be the set of all f that are eventually in alpha when multiplied by itself enough times. Thus, the ideal of the zero set of alpha is a subset of the radical of alpha. Is it actually equal to the radical itself? To answer this, suppose we have an element in the radical of alpha. Then by definition, f to some power r is in alpha, and as such, f to some power r evaluates to zero for any p in the zero set of alpha. However, since k is an integral domain, this means that f evaluated to zero under input p in the first place, and since this holds for every p in the zero set of alpha, then f is already in the ideal of the zero set of alpha, showing the radical is contained in the ideal of the zero set, and, along with our previous result, shows us that the ideal of the zero set of alpha is actually equal to the radical of alpha. Now, returning to the goal of a deeper understanding between our two spaces, let us consider the composition in the other way, of the zero set composed with the ideal. Start with some subset y of affine n space. Now, if we take the zero set of the ideal of y, by quickly expanding the definitions and taking equivalences, we get that it is the intersection of zero sets and as such is closed, prompting us to ask the question, is it the closure of y? To answer this, we start by letting w be a superset of y. If we assume that w is a closed set, we get, by definition, that w is actually the zero set of an ideal of polynomials, and so that zero set is then, by definition, a superset of y, or in other words, that the zero set contains y. However, this should be ringing some bells to some elementary properties mentioned earlier, and as such, applying the ideal to both sets flips containment. However, We've just shown the ideal of the zero set of alpha is equal to the radical of alpha, which contains alpha. So flipping containment one more time gives us that the zero set of alpha contains the zero set of the ideal of y. However, by definition this means that any closed set containing y contains the zero set of the ideal of y, and since the zero set of the ideal of y is closed in the first place, this shows us that the zero set of the ideal of y is actually the closure of y. Let's summarize everything we've done so far. First for that, some new notation. We denote the radical of the power set as the set of all ideals equal to their radicals. Such ideals alpha will be called radical ideals. Next, we denote by the closure of the power set as all the closed sets of affine n space, and also eventually the set of all closed sets of an arbitrary topological space. Thus, we summarize everything we've done so far by saying that the zero set and ideal functions take radical ideals to closed sets and vice versa, and that considering only these sets, we have that the zero set and ideal functions are inverses. Thus, we can study radical ideals by studying closed sets, and closed sets by studying radical ideals. Now, from experience in commutative algebra, ideals p such that products of elements outside the ideal stay outside of the ideal, called prime ideals, are much important to study, and since they correspond bijectively to certain closed sets of affine n space because prime ideals are radical, if a subset of affine n space is equal to the zero set of a prime ideal of polynomials, we say that the subset is an affine variety, which is the first major new object of study.
and the first question we choose to ask about them is if there's some intrinsic property defining affine varieties. For our first investigation of this question, let's just see if anything comes out of writing an affine variety as a union of two arbitrary subsets. Applying the ideal, by what we previously saw, we have the left-hand side simplifies to the original prime ideal, and the right-hand side simplifies to the intersection of two ideals, so that ultimately we have a prime ideal equal to the intersection of two ideals. To show the significance of this result, we need to take a quick commutative algebra break. Suppose we have an arbitrary prime ideal equal to an arbitrary intersection of ideals. Then, if we have elements in both ideals not in our prime ideals, then we know that their product is the intersection of the two ideals, and as such in the prime ideal, a contradiction. Thus, our prime ideal is equal to one of the two ideals of the intersection in the first place. Now, returning to the setup before the break, we see then that the prime ideal is equal to either of the ideals in the intersection, and applying the zero set function gets us that the affine variety is equal to the closure of one of the original sets we built the variety out of. Thus, letting the two subsets be both proper subsets of a variety, and letting them be closed, the previous result tells us that our variety cannot be written as the union of these two sets. We say that our affine variety is irreducible, which prompts the question, is every irreducible closed subset an affine variety? For this, let y be an irreducible closed subset of affine n-space, and let a product of elements be in the ideal. Then, applying the zero set function, we get that the zero set of the product is a superset of the zero set of the ideal, which simplifying on the right hand side gives us y, and on the left hand side gives us a union of the two zero sets. Thus, we write y as a union of itself intersected with the zero sets of the first element of the product, and the intersection of itself with the zero set of the second element of the product. From here, by irreducibility, y is equal to one of these sets, which by rolling out the definitions means that either f or g are in the ideal of y, and we conclude by saying that the ideal of y is prime. Along with our previous result, we can introduce the standard intrinsic definition of an affine variety, which states that y is an affine variety if and only if y is an irreducible closed subset of affine n space. Before we continue our abstract studies, let's ground ourselves in some examples of affine varieties. First, note that our set of polynomials A is a UFD, which implies that irreducible elements are prime. Thus, for f prime, we have that the zero set of f is an affine variety, called the hypersurface of degree f defined by f. This means that, specifically, the zero set of the zero ideal, equal to all of affine n space, is an affine variety, justifying the name of affine n space. As well, a neat detail to allude to how topology actually gives information about the algebra, let m be a maximal ideal. To say it's maximal is to say that its zero set is a single point. However, by definition this means our maximal ideal is generated of the following form, letting us actually get general forms for all maximal ideals of our space of polynomials. Let us examine a bit more topologically the properties of affine n-space. Let's have a decreasing sequence of closed sets of affine n-space. Thus, taking ideals gives us an increasing sequence of ideals, and since by the Hilbert basis theorem we have that our polynomial ring is Neuerthian, we have that these ideals are equal above some fixed n. Thus, since the closed sets biject onto any radical ideals, this means our closed sets are actually equal starting from that fixed n as well. This holds for any closed decreasing sequence of sets, and we express this by saying that affine n-space is Neuerthian. Thus, we can examine the properties of our space by looking at general properties of Neuerthian topological spaces. To start, let us have an arbitrary topological space, and assume it's T1. Then, for any arbitrary subset Y, we can write it as the infinite union of closed irreducible sets by just taking the points of Y and unioning them together. But, in the Neuerthian case, we can do much better. Let G be the set of closed sets Y that are not the finite union of irreducibles. Now. If there's some y in g, by the topological properties of x, and using a decreasing sequence, we can find some minimal closed set y prime in g. This means that y prime is not irreducible, and is thus the union of proper closed subsets. However, by minimality of y prime, these sets are a finite union of irreducibles, meaning that y prime is a finite union of irreducibles itself, and as such y prime is not in g, a contradiction. Thus, the initial assumption we made was wrong. So g is in fact empty, and as such every element is the finite sum of irreducible closed subsets. 
as well, there's a strengthening of the statement I'd be remiss not to mention. Let y be a closed set with a certain irreducible factorization. Then, if we have another irreducible factorization, we can say something strong about how these relate. First, we can write our first element in the factorization as a union of closed sets. So by irreducibility, the first element is equal to itself intersected with an element y sub j prime of the second factorization. We assume j is equal to 1 for simplicity. Then, doing the same thing for y sub 1 prime, we get that y sub 1 prime intersected with a certain y sub i in the first factorization is equal to y sub 1 prime. So, if we assume that there is no pairwise containment in either factorization, this has to lead us to the conclusion that y1 is equal to y1 prime. Thus, applying this argument inductively, which we can since there are only a finite number of sets, shows us that factorization into pairwise distinct irreducibles is actually unique. We now move away from many of the purely point-set topological ways to study affine n-space, and instead establish a new combinatorial tool. This will be denoted dim x, and will be the supremum of n such that we have a strictly decreasing chain of n irreducible closed subsets, where we only consider non-empty irreducible subsets. And this value will be called the combinatorial dimension of n. Now, let's get a footing of this idea of topological dimension by computing the dimension of affine 1 space. Its only closed irreducible subsets will be itself in singletons, as you should verify, and thus we can say that since a maximal chain of irreducible closed subsets consists of two sets, that the dimension of affine 1 space is 1. Before we can continue to say anything interesting through dimension, we need a quick topological aside. Let a space x be irreducible, y a subset of x, and z a subset of y that is irreducible under the subspace topology of y. Now, let z be the union of two sets that are closed in the topology of x. Then we have that the intersection of these two sets in y are closed in y and equal to z, so by irreducibility of z, it's equal to either of the closed sets of y, which by containment shows us that z is actually equal to one of the two closed sets in the first place. The upshot of this is that irreducible subspaces of subsets are irreducible in an ambient space. The main application of what we just proved and why we proved it is as follows. Suppose that we have an affine variety z with a decreasing chain of irreducible closed sets starting at z is equal to z0. Applying the ideal, we get an increasing chain of ideals with each ideal in the chain of a prime ideal. This prompts us, for another moment, to take another commutative algebra break. We have a combinatorial invariant of an ideal p, denoted HTP, for p usually prime, which is the supremum of all n, such that we have a strictly increasing sequence of prime subideals of our ideal. This is called the height of p, which can be thought of as how high you can get by stepping over prime subideals. From here, for an arbitrary ring A, this allows us to define the dimension of A as a supremum of heights of prime subideals, since prime ideals strictly can be seen to add dimension to another prime ideal if it's a strict superset. Now, returning to our strictly increasing sequence of prime ideals, we consider the quotient ring of the ring of polynomials by the prime ideal indexed by z0. In this context, containment of prime ideals correspond directly to containment of the zero ideal by a prime ideal in our quotient ring and so we biject our increasing sequence with an increasing sequence of prime ideals in the quotient ring, starting at the zero ideal. Saturating these chains of ideals and considering their supremums, we then get that through our bijection, that the dimension of our affine variety is the same as the dimension of the quotient ring of polynomials by the ideal of the variety. Thus, because of this combinatorial correspondence, we define the quotient ring explicitly, calling it the affine coordinate ring of our ideal. Now, we take a slight aside to brush up on some aspects of commutative algebra that will be so central to our analysis upcoming that it's not worth making a commutative algebra break. Let A be an arbitrary k module. Suppose that A has a ring structure that by assumption is commutative and with identity. Then, if the module structure distributes over multiplication, which is equivalent to saying that the map from our field to the ring defined by sending the scalar multiple of the unit to the scalar multiple of the unit is a homomorphism, we say that A is a k algebra which is important due to the following. First, the affine coordinate ring is defined as a quotient ring of our polynomial ring over a prime ideal, so it's an integral domain that is a finitely generated k-algebra. Now, if we have b, an arbitrary finitely generated k-algebra, that's an integral domain, 
it's able to be written for some n as the quotient ring of a by an ideal alpha. By integrality, alpha will be a prime ideal, and thus v will actually be the affine coordinate ring of some affine variety, meaning that studying the dimension of affine varieties is actually the same as studying the dimension of affine coordinate rings, which is the same as actually studying the dimension of finitely generated k algebras that are integral domains. So we can apply the theory from the last field of study to the first. However, a uh, fair warning. I warned earlier that many statements would be without proof, and most of the time so far I've tried to make it fairly inconsequential. The upcoming theory reference is not that. It is intense, abstract dimension theory, which while good for motivating why we care about dimension theory by seeing the results, may be actually painfully abstract without proper proofs. I'll try not to linger on details for too long, but just know this is a point where you may get lost if this is your first exposure. Without warning though, let's get into it. Earlier, we've shown topologically that the dimension of affine 1 space is 1, which prompts the obvious question, does this generalize so that the dimension of affine n space is n? To calculate, start by replacing the dimension of affine n space with its affine coordinate ring, which is just isomorphic to the original ring of polynomials in the first place. Now, a result from the dimension theory of finitely generated integral k algebras tells us that its dimension is equal to the transcendence degree of its field of fractions, which, by the fact that our polynomials have n distinct unrelated variables, shows that this is actually equal to n, and as such showing that, indeed, the dimension of affine n space is n, our first obvious application of dimension theory. Next, suppose we have an affine variety of the form of a zero set of alpha for alpha a prime ideal. The original statement we cited actually has a stronger second half, which gives us a formula to play around with dimension. Suppose for this play that the zero set of alpha has dimension n minus 1. Now, independently, we have that the height of alpha plus the dimension of the affine coordinate ring of alpha is equal to the dimension of our ring of polynomials, which has the same dimension of affine n space. However, from our previous result, we can replace our coordinate ring with the dimension of the affine variety, and thus we can substitute values and do a little bit of algebra to realize that the height of alpha is 1. From here, another result says that since a is a UFD, that alpha is a principal ideal. Call it the principal ideal of an element f. From here, since the principal ideal of f is prime, then f is prime and as such irreducible, meaning we have found all such forms of ideals that produce affine varieties of dimension n minus 1, showing dimension has classification potential. From here, let's quickly check the converse. If alpha is the principal ideal of an irreducible f, then Krull's Hopf-Diel shots shows us that alpha has height 1, and by doing the previous algebra again, we get that the affine variety defined by alpha has dimension n minus 1, giving us classification of all forms of affine varieties of dimension n minus 1. We've mainly only worked with affine varieties so far, but it turns out other forms of varieties end up being useful to consider, so we'll end the lecture part of the video by going over them through a motivating example. Consider what we've just proven. If f is irreducible, then the dimension of its affine variety is n minus 1. Thus, if we're given an arbitrary polynomial f, if its zero set has dimension n minus 1, we see that f is potentially irreducible, since it doesn't produce a contradiction with our previous result. Note, this terminology from what I know isn't standard, but it's a good motivating example in my experience. Now, suppose we have some issue that requires us to make a test for irreducibility based off a of polynomial's zero set's dimension. The zero set can potentially be extremely poorly behaved for our purposes, so we look for subsets that have the same dimension to simplify the search of points that we're actually checking over. This is an issue that can't be completely addressed algebraically. Suppose we have a proper subset of an irreducible subset, such that its closure is still a proper subset. Then we'll have that the dimension of the subset is strictly less than, and as such not the same, as the dimension of the space we care about, and since the algebra only tells us about the closed sets, this is extremely likely to occur. So we move to the realm of pure topology for ideas. Suppose we have an irreducible set x, and let u be an open subset of it that's non-empty. Since we're mainly working with closed sets, we write u in an equivalent form, and consider some properties of this open set. Suppose we can write it as a union of sets, with these sets closed. Then, we can write x as the union of its complement with another set and that set, which by assumption is equal to the union of three proper closed subsets, 
a contradiction to the irreducibility of x, and as such, u is irreducible. As well, by unioning its closure with c, we get x. By irreducibility, meaning that, since u is non-empty, that u is dense, which all culminates to saying that the dimension of u is less than or equal to the dimension of x. So we consider them as potential subsets of affine varieties to take dimension of, to test the dimension of the whole affine variety. From that, suppose that u is a non-empty open subset of an affine variety. By inequality of dimension, and the fact that our variety is a subset of affine n-space, we get that the dimension of u is less than or equal to the dimension of affine n-space, meaning that the dimension of u, which we'll denote by n' prime in this proof, is actually finite. Thus, by definition we can find some maximal chain of irreducible closed subsets of y, taking special note to consider that our bottom element, by non-emptiness, must be a singular point denoted p. Now, taking closures of these sets gives us a maximal, in the sense that it cannot be extended, chain of subsets of our affine variety, since u is dense in the variety, with p still unchanged. Now, this point that's a subset of an affine variety, upon taking its ideal, is embedded into a maximal ideal of the affine coordinate ring, and, bringing back in our favorite dimension theory result while considering the affine coordinate ring, gives us at the height of this maximal ideal, plus the dimension of the quotient ring of our affine coordinate ring by this ideal, is the dimension of the affine coordinate ring itself. Now, by maximality of the ideal, we see that our center ring is actually isomorphic to our base field k, giving us the dimension of our affine variety in terms of the height of m in the affine coordinate ring, plus the dimension of our field. Now, by maximality of this chain of closed subsets, we get that the height of m is equal to n prime, and since k is a field, and as such having only one prime ideal, we get its dimension is equal to zero. And thus by the theorem, n prime is equal to the dimension of our affine variety, and by definition of n prime, this means the dimension of u is equal to the dimension of our entire affine variety. So we can check the dimension of the non-empty open subsets to check for potential irreducibility. Now, while the application of checking potential irreducibility is neat, notice that open subsets of affine varieties have many amazing properties resembling the ambient space, including irreducibility, density, and combinatorial dimension. Thus, since they are almost varieties in most specific properties, we end this lecture by a definition for later. If u is a non-empty open subset of an affine variety, then we say that u is a quasi-affine variety, which will be intensely studied when we get to morphisms between varieties. And that formally ends the lecture part of the video, so let's quickly review everything we learned. First, we studied the topological properties of zero sets of polynomials. Then, we saw how this introduced a deeper connection between closed subsets of affine n-space and radical ideals. From there, we used this connection to introduce some dimension theoretic results, and concluded with the example of potential irreducibility to inspire us to consider quasi-affine varieties. Next section will be considerably shorter, although more likely to be experimental, using structures behind graded rings to define projective varieties, and hinting at scheme theory through the patching together of affine varieties in relation to projective space. To completely round out this video, I'll just end with some information about where this project is likely to go. I'm going to have to prepare for an upcoming college term, um, including studying a lot of other mathematics unrelated to this, so don't expect the video series to continue anytime relatively soon, but I can promise that I've been enjoying this, so I'm likely going to be continuous, um, continuing to just grind through this in the background while I'm just finishing up my classwork. Until, until I have it done, though. Until I have it finish. If you're still watching this, see ya. Take it as easy as you can.